Um, Ryan, thanks so much for the invitation to be here this week. Uh, I got to say, it's a humbling experience being in church this morning. I actually, Ryan, I don't know how you do it each week or all the speakers. It's my first time speaking here, and some of you speak a little more regularly. I, you spend all week or a couple of weeks like preparing your talk, thinking deeply, saying, I want to really bring something really important, and then you're here, or I was here this morning, and get immersed into worship and hearing the conversation, and you realize, like, I am like not even close to the most important thing that's happening this morning. It's so good to see all the ways that you're connecting in community and that God invites us into worship. So um, that's a great reminder, and I'm glad to be here. Um, so just one thing to think about. Uh, we're going to have a lot of information today. you got handouts. Don't look at those just yet, but if you already are, that's fine too. We're going to move into a practice in just a second, but I want to uh, emphasize we're going to have a time of Q&A today. So after I share a few ideas, engage in some practice, um, we'll talk. You might hear something that's really strange, different, that doesn't work, doesn't make sense, goes against something you've been taught before, or just you want to know more. And so there's a lot of room here for you to disagree, for you to have questions, for you to just want us to unpack it uh, together. So if there's anything that stands out to you, notice it, chew on it. Um, you're probably not going to be able to take everything in because Eric has said there will be a lot. And that's one of the reasons why you have a handout. You can go back to it. You don't have to take in every script. You don't have to kind of come up with every principle. But um, if there's something that sits with you, um, bring it up and we'll chat afterwards. So uh, like Ryan said, uh, I'm a psychologist. I'm a professor. Um, I'm a part of a family uh, and a part of a family of Midtown, but we'll lean into the psychologist bit for just a second. So I'm going to start us off with a relaxation technique that I sometimes use with clients that I teach with my students. Um, and this is audience participation, so please join along with me. I want you, uh, if you're comfortable, find a comfortable seat into your chair. Settle in, usually feet, two feet firmly on the ground, let the chair kind of support your body. And then next level, if you feel comfortable, I want to invite you to close your eyes. And now, eyes closed, I want you to imagine a beautiful, peaceful place. A place of calm, rest, relaxation. Bring that place to mind and allow yourself to be there. Breathe deeply as you settle into this place. Immerse yourself there with all your senses. Notice the vivid detail, the colors, the sights, any elements that draw your attention. Notice any sounds that are in your place. Listen and tune in. Enjoy them. Feel any textures there, maybe with your hands or under your feet, or maybe it's just the sensations that are impressing on your skin or your face. And just take a moment and find peace and rest there. All right, as you're ready, you can open your eyes and return your focus back to the room. Some people might not want to come back. Relaxation exercises, there's a bunch of different ones. Not everyone works with each exercise, but some do. For some of you, was that a relaxing experience? Calming or peace? Good. Now, that's, that's free. You guys can take that anywhere you go. You can use that in your day. <laughs> But I'm curious for us today about the places that you chose. I didn't use any language to tell you what kind of environment you should put yourself in, other than it should be peaceful and calm. How many of you chose somewhere in nature, river and forest? Hands up. OK, look around. Without any instruction, notice what you all did. OK, how many of you chose? in your car in a traffic jam in downtown <laughs> on the 41 the rush hour. OK, so I think that the second question is ridiculous, right? And your laughter tells me you do too. I don't think this is a coincidence. When invited to meditate on what's peaceful, 
what's restful, where we're going to find calm. We go to places that are natural. Maybe there's a little bit of human tending in the process, but not large built environments, lots of mechanical sounds, lots of tech flooding us. No, I think this is not a coincidence. This is how we've been made. It's relevant, I think, for how God has designed us. And it's relevant as we see in lots of research and I think as we see in the Bible for our physical health, for our mental and emotional and our relational health, and I think it's relevant for our spiritual health. And I think your intuition, when we look around and see all these hands up, actually shows that you know this, that I'm not actually bringing something that's wildly different and new. That you know this, and a lot of what it might say might sound pretty intuitive once you hear it, or already is to you. And yet, often in the life of faith or in our church experiences, this connection hasn't been made for us, or even we've been taught something different or something against it based on certain church traditions or approaches to faith. So today I think we're going to make some connections to stuff that already is going to make sense to you. And yet, like I said, there could be some things that are different or that don't work or that at least you need some help making sense of. So we'll have that Q&A time. So to get us started, um, I want to just cover a couple of stories that are mile markers on this journey that I didn't know I was on until recently. When I moved to Fresno in 2013, I made a friend who had a bit of land in a Reedley. Um, And she had a grapevine that had been ignored for several years. And being from Canada and not having a lot of time around grapevines, she had asked me, hey, I need some help taking care of this thing. And I foolishly said, yes, I'll come help you. (laughs) And I wrestled with that grapevine for a whole long hot day and I lost. Um, But I walked away from that experience realizing that I had spent a lifetime reading the Bible which was full of stories of grapevines. And I, even though I might have driven by a few, I had never actually encountered a grapevine in that way before. And all of a sudden, some of the things in the Bible made a whole lot more sense. And I had this greater appreciation, for example, of Isaiah 5, where God describes this process of pruning, caring for, tending, drawing out this vineyard, hoping, expecting, Justice, good fruit, health in the land and in the people, and then it doesn't go that way. And even though I'd read that story many times, something was different because I had now lived an experience with the grapevine. And this helped me to see that the metaphors of the Bible, many of which are nature metaphors, if I were to encounter them more, I would actually better understand aspects of the life of faith. And it showed on the other side that there were a lot of things in my day-to-day life that were really distant, really different from the day-to-day life of the Bible. And therefore, there was also probably a lot going on in the Bible that I was missing, because my life just didn't align. So that insight stuck with me, but I didn't didn't kind of overhaul everything. I just was noticing it, paying attention to it. Um, Fast forward to 2020. None of you want to remember that, but it's part of our story, so we'll bring it up here. For me... Connor, our son, was born in July of 2020. So we're trying to figure out how to be new parents while isolated in a pandemic. And that was really hard. One break that we got from this lonely daily struggle of figuring it out was taking Connor outside for a walk. We could do that in the mornings when it was cool, in the evenings after it cooled down. And that was a real blessing to us. And then he's two months old and the creek fire hit. And all of a sudden, the air is choked with smoke. And we can't take him outside. The air quality is too poor for his little lungs. And so this one stress reliever that we have is taken away from us. And now I'm conscious all the more, first of the pandemic, now the fire, I'm aware of California's history with drought, learning more about various things going on in the globe. And now also my sense of the future has been extended because I have a child. That my future now isn't just my own, it's his. And it's his children's future. And these are now futures that I'm invested in. And that event has changed my life. It's a set of experiences that said you have to change. I can't keep living the same way I always have. Even if I was conscious, even if I thought about it, even if I tried to make some simple practices in my daily life for a better world, I had to change more. My work, my life, my energy had to go towards a viable future for Connor and for his children. So I've been trying to work that out ever since. It's been confusing, it's been questioning, 
Um, it's changed a lot, it's led to confrontation. I feel like I'm still at the very beginning of the journey, not the end. But today I'm here sharing a few reflections on connecting to the spirit through nature, in part because this is what's emerged over these last several years of trying to pay attention to what's going on in our world and in the Bible and in the life of faith and reflect on what that means for our time in scripture today. So here we go, I've got five observations. I hope we'll get to most of them, even if we don't get to too much detail in all of them, we'll have a chance to talk together. So number one, creation is everywhere in scripture and connection with creation is actually assumed. Number two, creation and its members are active participants in the life with God. Three, we are creatures, we are nature, and we are made for right relationship with nature and with creation and with God. Number four, wilderness is a place where we meet God in spiritual and profound transformation. And five, biblical neighbor love and the care for the least of these requires ecological justice, requires us to be proactive and intentional in how we care for creation. So taking the first one, um, we'll probably touch on a few verses here. There's going to be even more verses or more time for them in your handout. So again, that's kind of why it's there. We don't have to get through everything in detail. But think about this story with the vine. The Bible is written in a world with no cars, no electricity, no power tools, no grocery stores, no social media, no faucets. People, some of the people are nomadic. They don't even have homes that stay in one place. Most people work directly with the land. They have a daily dependent intimate relationship with earth, with weather, with sun and moon and stars, with wild and domesticated plants and animals. And that's a really different context from my life. I read the Bible in post-enlightenment technological colonial society. So my life is dominated by mastery over and distance from nature. And it's moving more that way every day. That separates me from the daily and the seasonal rhythms of creation. Lights and cell phones, not the sunrise and sunset. Heating and cooling systems, in my car, my house, not the rhythms of the seasons. Even the grocery store more than the productive earth. And because of when I live, the ideas that shape my brain are more about logic and reason, science and technology, power and control, more about seeing nature as a mechanical system for me to use, rather than having a spiritual dimension. And these ideas would have been totally foreign to the people in the Bible. So one thing for us today is, you might have heard this word hermeneutics. It's kind of a fancy word for how we interpret the Bible. We have a way to go in lots of dimensions. I do think we're doing at least a little better today at understanding how certain issues of history or politics or culture are shaping our reading of scripture. But I think one area we haven't done very much of at all is how different our natural environment is today from the environment of scripture and how that influences how we read scripture. And indeed, the Bible is full of nature because that's what people had a lot of interaction with. Nature helped people to put into words their experience of faith. Language uses metaphor because it's hard to put experience into words. We don't know how to describe it, so we make connections with stuff that we already know. The authors of scripture often did that for their experience of faith with God as regards creation. Vineyards as we talk about it. But faith that moves mountains or mustard seas or as the deer pants for the water. We talk about growing deeper or being deeply rooted. All of these are natural parts of our language so full of nature and so common to us that we don't even experience it. We don't even notice that that's what's going on. And yet, as I discovered in the vineyard, if we were to connect more fully to the nature that is the basis for these metaphors, we might actually understand the experience of faith a lot more. And that's gonna take some countercultural work because our life is just not organized that way. So in addition to metaphors, there's so much about nature and scripture that's not obvious from our modern eyes, but it really does change things if we start to notice it. For example, in Genesis, got a couple of scriptures from Genesis 1 and Genesis 8. We see that God says, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night and lights for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And later on after the flood, Genesis reiterates, the seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease. Embedded pre and post flood is this notion that seasonality, rhythms, 
movement of weather is a part of creation, is a part of the human experience. And snuck in there a little bit if we actually notice is that the sun, the moon, and the stars are signs and symbols for helping us keep track of the seasons. People would have known how to interpret the movement of the stars and the moon, but I don't know how to do that. That's not how my life goes. I use calendars and phones to do that. And in fact, I grew up in a faith context that would have said to even pay attention to that or to think about that would be probably going against the Bible, going against faith. Because in addition to the practical side, I kind of mentioned this enlightenment thinking, we've been taught that looking to nature is a lesser practice, that what counts is the supernatural. Enlightenment puts reason over emotion, mind over body, science over intuition, and technology over tradition and more. We have all these dichotomies and we've often brought them right into our faith. But theologian David Bentley Hart says these are false dichotomies. There is no difference between the one gift of both creation and being spiritually formed in Christ-likeness. There is one gracious act. All the way up is nature, all the way down is spirit, and they're coming together. So all this is going to set the stage for a bunch of other passages that you're going to be able to kind of review on your own, Um, but I want to just look at a few more. John 3.16, for example, some of the most famous passages you might have, right? God so loved the world. If you think about this passage, how do you fill in this notion of world that God wants to save? Think unconsciously and really unknowingly for a long time, I just filled it in with the human world, all the people. God wants to save, God sent Jesus for all the people. And yet a nature hermeneutic has allowed me to see, oh, this word is actually cosmos, for God so loved the cosmos. God set out to save the cosmos. And when I hear this word cosmos, it trips my mind to a completely different order of salvation, a completely different awareness of what is God's concern and what is God's redemption plan. I can't just think cosmos and assume that that only means kind of all the two-footed mouth breathers in this room and beyond, right? It's so much more. And I think you can take a look um, at Colossians 1.15 and all the ways in which Christ is the firstborn of all creation and in and through all in all. Another set of nature metaphors for us that's pretty important here would be the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is wind. Holy Spirit is poured out, which is water. Holy Spirit is fire. Holy Spirit is dove. What would happen if we were to lean into these nature metaphors and learn more about the Holy Spirit by paying attention to that. I'm on point one and I think I'm already over time, so that's gonna be a useful (laughs) marker for me. I knew that I had way too much material, but how it actually plays out is a whole other process here. So I'm gonna just make a couple of comments as we go and maybe you wanna cycle back and forth into some other uh, questions or uses of your handout. Creation is an active member and participant in life with God. In fact, it's not here just for our use. It exists in its own relation to God and does so with a spiritual life. Listen to Job 12. Ask the animals and they will teach you. The birds of the air and they will tell you. Ask the plants of the earth and they will teach you. The fish of the sea will declare to you. Do we do this as a spiritual practice? Do we listen? Do we meet creation and ask it to teach us? It seems to know, Job seems to say that they have a better knowledge of God than we do. What if we live that out? You can also see that in Psalm 19. And there's a different direction here too. Isaiah 14, three through eight. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers that struck down the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows. And the whole earth is at rest and quiet they break forth into singing. The cypresses exult over you, king of Babylon. The cedars of Lebanon say, since you were laid low, no one comes to cut us down. The health of the land and its praise or mourning is a mirror of whether society is in or out of God's design. The end of the Babylonian empire is good news to Israel and to the earth. Both rejoice because the people are liberated from an evil king 
and the land can rest and rejoice because the empire's economic machine no longer comes to exploit it. This is a completely different attunement to what God is doing in scripture. And the opposite side you see in Hosea, many of you are aware of there is no faithfulness or loyalty or no knowledge of God in the land. That might be a scripture that you've heard before. You might not have seen that the land is mourning and the wild animals and the birds. These are lamentations where the earth is crying out to God in a spiritual statement. So ecological health, whether it's wilderness or animal protection, land free from chemical or material plastic waste, climate change, environmental impact, or ecological destruction, deforestation, extinction. These are not just science facts. These are not just political baits. They are spiritual conditions. And if we're able to have our eyes open to the biblical text with a new hermeneutic, we might be able to see this. I'm going to kind of just join number three and four. Uh, There is a lot of research that shows that humans are mentally, emotionally, physically healthier with nature contact and really struggle when they're cut off from green and blue spaces. So we have this kind of foundational level of health when we have opportunities to be in nature. And then we also have opportunities for deep spiritual formation. Moses in Exodus 3 goes to keep the flock and he takes his flock beyond the wilderness and he comes to Horeb, which is the mountain of God. And in a bush, that is burning, God meets him there. And oh, yeah, there's Jesus too. He is baptized, a dove descends from heaven as he's baptized into the river, and immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. The Spirit is the active agent sending Jesus out for prayer and fasting to receive the inner and outer confrontations with Satan and reliance on God and the process of spiritual transformation that kicks off his public ministry. The wilderness is where we meet God and I'm guessing many people in here also have your own stories of when you had a spiritual experience that was connected through nature. So many religious figures, even outside the Christian tradition, so many Christian forefathers and foremothers, so many mystics, have gone into the wilderness to find God. The wilderness is a place that takes us out of our creature comforts, teaches us dependence and reliance on God, brings us into contact with often our inner fears and demons, but allows us to submit them to God and to be transformed. And lastly, biblical neighbor love and care for the least of these requires ecological justice. Many people here in this church I know are committed to social justice. Social justice is God's heart. Social justice is ecological justice. You cannot separate the two. Creation care matters for all and it matters especially for the most vulnerable. In the Bible, ecological ruin and distress of the land is consistently linked with economic injustice and the exploitation of the poor and of the land by the empire and the rich and the powerful. It's just start to finish in the text. And we could spend time looking at the Sabbath and how the Sabbath worked its way out. We could spend time looking at the prophets. Those are scriptures that are all available to you. But I think if we want to follow Jesus through attention to the least of these and to our neighbor, we discover surprising moral responsibilities in the text. And I think if we look at where creation is right now and the people who are suffering because Nature is groaning, creation is groaning. We will see three neighbors for whom ecological justice is necessary that we are not paying attention to. Socially, racially, and economically marginalized people in the US and globally have the least amount of access to green space. They have the most impact from chemical and environmental production, um, from climate change. They have the least access to healthy food and clean water. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of the statistics in Fresno, the Flint Flint water crisis, um, issues in rural places as well as urban places. Um, These are all very central to what's going on. Heat deserts, food deserts, we can go on. Second is children and future generations. Future generations are our downstream nature, our generational neighbors. We have neighborly responsibilities to care for them, even if we don't think about them. And young people, young people are struggling today. They feel betrayed by 
a generation before them, a church before them that doesn't seem to care for the earth. People are being alienated from their churches, from the life of faith because they don't find a church that cares for their future. And then the earth, its non-human members, its rivers, its forests, its animals, its trees are actually, maybe, maybe it's strange, maybe they are our neighbors too. Maybe they're the ones that we overlook in our pursuit of our own care or convenience. So even if these last points are the harder ones to sit with, even if they're way too fast for us to make any sense of them, I actually think the Christian faith is designed for us to acknowledge the reality of what's difficult and to find hope in miracles and in possibility for transformation. And when we add the earth or its animals or plants to our rhythms, our spiritual formation is actually not about replacing God with creation or elevating nature to God or over God. It's that we discover more of God in nature. It doesn't empty the world that we live in of God, it fills the world with God. It doesn't displace our love of God away or our commitment to faith in Jesus away towards nature, it deepens our love of God and our commitment to faith more in and as and through the natural world as we participate in it. So, sorry for going so long. We might, Ryan, you'll have to determine if we have any room for questions with no, our service, just, but no, thank you so much for our time. Yeah, no apologies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think what I want to do, Adam has a little bit of a, a deeper spiritual reflection for us to participate in. So I, I actually just want to use the question reflection space. Um, I'll start with one and then We'll get to at least one more. Uh, I'm not going to do the text thing today. Danny, if you can, if you can build a slide real quick that simply just puts the email info at midtownfresno.church. Info at midtownfresno.church. That will be up on the screen. If you want to ask more questions, deeper questions, what we can do is we can take those emails over this week and we can actually pass them on to Adam and he can interact with you a bit more. Yeah, happy uh, to. So I, I, what's interesting is uh, Murray Bowman, he uh, popularized in... Th therapy, social, mm -hmm. psychology, sociology, the way it works is something called systems theory. And mm -hmm. what it does is it actually understands everything that we find ourselves in, not as individual cause and effect, but a part of a larger system and how anxiety moves in through that system. And oftentimes the, uh, a lot of tragic things are more in response to the anxieties that, that are unnamed in, in between and how we work out relationally. What's interesting is Murray Bowen actually has a lot of thoughts around how that works within nature and creation. Mm, yeah. um, and one thing he simply said, and he, for you who want to ask a question and be thinking about it, Adam will have a short response here and then I'll walk to you and, and hold the mic for you. Um, he asked the question, how do we participate as a part of it, mm -hmm. as a part of creation, as a part of nature, not steward as if we were apart from it? Yeah. And just that little step, can you just say just a couple things on that? Yeah. Um... I think it starts with, with an I don't know. I mean, my answer to you is I don't know, but I think it starts for each of us being willing to start with an I don't know. Um, and because I don't know, it means my first steps are probably gonna be clunky, I'm probably gonna make mistakes. I'm gonna have to read, I'm gonna try stuff out, it might work, it might not. Um, but I think the, the point of humility, right, the experience of humility that I have as I come up here, the humility that, that says I'm just gonna go out in nature and maybe just look, maybe just sit with, maybe just, turn my phone off or leave it in the car and then just see what do I know and what do I don't know. I mean, I think I would start there. Um, I can give you a bunch of answers, but I don't think they're as powerful as if you kind of go on this journey yourself. And some of you might and some of you might not. I can't kind of do any control over that. But you work these things out as you slowly go. And then I think the thing is you talk about it. You find someone, you find me, you find someone else. You just say, this came up and I'm wondering about it and now I don't know where to go with it, but I'm going to, you know, just have a conversation in there. Because um, we're so far, any practice is often going to move us forward a little bit, and then you just got to take the next one, even if it screws up. That's good. I like it. Anybody burning for a question? Ish. All, all the way in the back, man. <sighs> I'm coming, I'm coming. All right, I'll, I'll promise to make this one worth it. Uh, uh, first of all, love the subject matter. Thank you so much for, for sharing all the thoughts. It's a bit of a controversial question, so feel free to please jump yeah. in, the, in the best way you uh, can. What what is your thoughts about uh, someone that uses a simulated natural experience? Maybe that's a you know something that's uh, controversial, or like a, a drug or substance to, to do that, or even something to the effect of like you know melatonin or ginseng or something like that that helps to sleep. What, any any thoughts on, on simulating the natural world in our everyday environments? 
Oh, when you said simulated natural experience, I thought you were going to talk about VR, for example. Um, I, I was thinking about Sims. Anybody remember Sims? Sims, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, VR, like VR is interesting because they, they do that in some of the research. And the research interesting shows VR is kind of better than nothing, but it's not as good as the real thing. You know, I think that says something. Um, I think there are all sorts of ways that our bodies have interacted with plants, right? I mean, talk about whether it's melatonin, kind of synthetic chemicals, um, how we do that. I don't know that those would be simulated. I think those are actually a variety of real experiences, all of which we have to interpret in um, an appropriate cultural context. So I think most, and I'm not going to give a specific, but most experiences when titrated and properly grounded in a meaningful larger context, um, most can be appropriate and most, and not most, all are available to be misused, exploited, and totally take us away from what's ultimately true. Um, yeah, there's lots of deeper conversation we can have on kind of individual things. There's a pretty big difference, I'd say, between say ginseng and psychedelics, if we're gonna kind of give one answer, let's cover them all, so um, yeah, but thank you. Can I, can I just end with one? Uh, um just maybe, yeah, where we find ourselves, thinking about younger generations that are digitally native, they're growing up with yeah. screens, with technology. Um, a few thoughts on the idea of our relation to nature and creation and the anxiety that we could be experiencing generationally. Um, I, I, think they're, I think they're right there. I don't think you can really separate out our economics, our tech, our relationship with creation, our relationship with the built environment, I don't think our political divide, like all of these things that we kind of each individually know as a problem, they're all interconnected. They're all part of systems theory and they all have their own ways. Um, yeah, there is, there is a ton. I mean, when you go out into the world and you push on a rock and it pushes back on you, when you climb a mountain and both discover the power of climbing that and the humility of discovering how small I am in that, the actual lived experience of that grounds you into, I am a real life human being with a body who belongs in this world. I pushed and the earth first pushed back. Like just the sense of stability in a body, in an identity, in a groundedness, you cannot replace that through living out the same practice on a screen. You cannot replace that through a text message. You cannot replace that indoors in a deep therapeutic conversation, right? I mean, as a therapist who also does all of these other things too, they're all irreplaceable. So yeah, I think absolutely we're having a generation who's really disconnected from, from free play, looking at the impact of children developing imagination through three, free play with nature versus not having the imagination because they already have the play structured for them on their phone or on their tablet or whatever. I mean, there is so much that developmentally is right in connection with what we're struggling with because what we're not developing, because we're not actually out and getting our hands dirty, yeah. That's so good. Uh, Adam clearly has not exhausted any of his <laughs> thoughts uh, or knowledge on this. So again, info, admit to, if you want to just press a little bit deeper in some of this, if this is it, it, it grabbing you in a certain way, I would encourage you to, to, to connect and reach out to keep the conversation going. Um, what we're going to do now is, is the team is just going to start playing behind. Adam will invite us back in to settle in for a little bit of a, a, a spiritual practice and reflection. I'll come back up and move us into communion and then ministry time. All right, so if this has stirred up anything in you, I understand. I apologize for not having more question time. Um, I do want to interact. I'll be hanging around after service. I'm happy to follow up by email or have a coffee or kind of wherever you want to go with this. Um, I want to invite you back into that peaceful place, which now we know is a peaceful nature-based place that you were at the beginning. Settle back in there. Close your eyes, take some deep breaths, re-immerse yourself in that natural space. And we're just gonna create a little bit of time for you to now also explicitly recognize that this is also a spiritual place, a place to meet God. So I want you to invite God into that space consciously, even though he's already there, but invite him in. I'm going to give you some options. You just see what settles with your spirit. 
Maybe you just want to enjoy the peace and the beauty there with God. That's a spiritual practice. Do that. Maybe you want to spend time in praise. Praise God for creation. Praise God for this beautiful space that you're in right now. That's a spiritual act. Do that. Maybe you want to ask God to direct your attention to some natural feature, something that's striking or beautiful, something to see and smell and feel and contemplate and enter deeply and discover God there. Ask God to direct your attention and lean in there. Maybe you want to ask God to teach you something in this place. How might God do that there? And lastly, maybe you want to ask God to reveal one way he wants you to participate in the protection or redemption project of creation. How will you be a part of preserving and expanding more of creation for you and for all of your neighbors? Ask God that and see what he says. can spend the whole music time in this contemplation. Whenever you're ready, you'll be able to open your eyes and join back into the music as the team leads. And I just invite you to listen and take seriously what God might say during this time. Thank you.